Okay, go. I guess picnic and uh, hopefully you won't be disappointed in what I have to share for the message part of this. We are going to be talking about a pretty serious topic and I know everybody is at a different place in life. Your experiences won't look the same as mine but the hope with these videos is always that you know sharing some experience or sharing thoughts on serious topics especially related to the gospel will hopefully encourage you or you can pass on to encourage someone else um, just wherever you're at and so what i want to talk to you about today is sometimes there will be a bad or negative experience that we have with a church or you know a group of fellow believers and that can push us away from pursuing a relationship with God. And that is just such a sad, heartbreaking thing to hear when people share their stories with me. And of course I've experienced it, so I know, I understand the hurt, I can relate to it. And it's just, it amazes me that this is such a common thing. And it can be for a variety of reasons. It usually falls into one of these four categories. There are other circumstances, but this is just the general overview. And maybe you can relate to one of these situations. Maybe it's happened to you. And offer a little bit of encouragement at the end. This one will probably sound familiar. Even if it hasn't personally happened to you, chances are you know someone who has experienced this, and that is hypocrisy. This is one of the main reasons we hear that people turn away from the faith or leave the church. It's preaching one thing and then doing the exact opposite. So this takes many shapes and forms, but it can be as simple as the pastor preaches a message against gossip from the pulpit and then immediately after that goes and talks crap about the lady running the children's ministry to a deacon or another church member. And being a witness to that can be very discouraging uh, when your leaders don't practice what they preach, especially when 
they are the ones giving you the encouragement to live in that way and then they're not doing it. It is very discouraging to see. And the more of this kind of hypocrisy you see in the church body, the more cynical you can become and want to distance yourself from Jesus and Christianity altogether. Another one that happens pretty often is unbiblical teaching. So you join a Bible study group or you join a new church and at first everything is legit, like it's Bible based and everything seems to be on the up and up and the longer you spend time with them, the longer you study with them, things kind of go off the rails and things are being taught that are not biblically based. As you start to do your own Bible study, it's becoming kind of clear that some of the things they're teaching don't exactly align with the Word of God. And I'll share a brief example. I won't give away any personal information, but this happened with a friend of mine where she had recently left a church and was looking for a Bible study group and found one that she was really happy with. Everything seemed legit. They were teaching Bible-based principles. Nothing seemed to be you know, out of the ordinary or against the gospel. But as time went on, they started to talk about uh, another way besides Jesus, a mother or goddess figure, just adding this extra deity, this female deity that is another way besides the son, besides the father, besides the spirit, and uh, just adding this fourth party in there as a thing to be worshipped. So she couldn't in good conscience keep attending this Bible study because even after bringing to them that, hey, this is nowhere in the Bible, there's no evidence for this, this is, you know, adding something to the gospel that is simply not there and worshipping something that is not God, uh, they weren't open to that. They refused to acknowledge that this was a false or unbiblical teaching. And of course, I'm not talking about, you know, if your pastor or Bible study leader has a different view on like denominational issues like drinking or dancing or, you know, those kinds of things. That's not a gospel issue and not what I am talking about. I mean, like that example, bringing in some extra deity to worship. And I've seen this myself where a church will just go off the rails and you just can't in good conscience keep attending there. And it makes you hesitant to attend another church or attend another Bible study because if you've seen it happen, you know, twice, three times, it can really make you skeptical about attending another church, attending another Bible study and putting yourself into another situation like that. So maybe it's not false teaching or, you know, hypocrisy. Maybe it's abandonment. This is another one that happens so often in churches where, you know, especially in college ministries where they bring you in through some big exciting event. You know, you're brought into this community of believers. They share the gospel with you and you receive Jesus and then you fall to the wayside. Nobody disciples you. Nobody mentors you and no one helps you as far as your new walk with Christ. They don't really teach you the apologetics. Sure, they tell you what you should believe, but not why we believe it and how to answer those really hard questions that come up. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I learned all this stuff in college and then I get out into the field and there's so many things I wasn't prepared for, so many skills that I'm lacking. And it is kind of the same way with our faith. We enter into this field with just the basics, just kind of knowing like who Jesus is and what his purpose is in our life and a vague idea of how we're supposed to live now. But then we get confronted with these tough situations, these scary circumstances, and we don't know how to answer hard questions and deal with these situations that arise and have no strong Christian leaders to kind of guide us in our young faith. But all of this to say it can lead to feelings of abandonment, being just let down, tossed to the wayside, like, okay, now I'm just another butt to fill a church seat and there's no one to invest in me and genuinely take the time to guide me and help me figure out this new life in Christ that a lot of times can be overwhelming and kind of confusing, especially when we have those really hard questions and we don't know how to answer them, how to study and research to get those answers that we need. And people usually end up leaving the church feeling burned and hurt and forgotten about. This last one I want to share before giving you some comfort, encouragement, whatever. 
has to do not so much with other people, uh, but more our own choices and then the reaction when those things are addressed or brought to light and that's conviction. And this is one that nobody wants to hear. It hurts our pride to hear that something we're doing is wrong or that we need to change in some way because change is painful, especially when it calls us to sacrifice things in our lifestyle that we're very dependent on and nobody wants to think about having to go through all of that change and possibly pain and sacrifice that comes along with giving things up and that can push us away from the church especially when it's addressed in a way that is not tactful so maybe a church member who thinks they have a better relationship with you than they actually do uh, kind of care fronts you about the issue, be it a sin in your life or something about your general lifestyle that is contradictory to the gospel. And it kind of hurts. Like I said, it hurts our pride and we just kind of want to plug our fingers in our ears and, you know, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, or run away, leave the church and say, well, they were judging me. They weren't accepting me like I am, instead of taking that really hard look at ourselves. and what we are doing and does this honor Jesus the way that we're living is this an actual sin I need to address in my life and is there something I have to sacrifice and I'm not talking once again about those little denominational issues like I keep using drinking and dancing but Lord have mercy I have seen churches torn apart over these things but I'm talking about the hard lines in the sand that the Bible draws and says absolutely not you are not to do this. This fourth one is pretty complicated, but just know I get it. I've been there too, and it is a really uncomfortable and sucky position to be in because like I said a million times already in this, it hurts our pride and we don't want to have to go through all of that change and possible sacrifice in order to live the life that Jesus calls us to live. That's just our sinful nature and it is a whole heck of a lot easier to pretend that we don't hear it, we're not convicted about it, and oh that person is just judging me, they're just wrong, and then we don't feel a call to action to do anything differently. But so as for the first three, so that hypocrisy, false teaching, uh, abandonment, Please do not, if you've been in that situation, please do not let that prevent you from pursuing a meaningful relationship with God. And here's why. Those church leaders, those Bible teachers, whoever they are, they are still human. They're still flawed, sinful people just like you or me. They are not perfect. And God is not a reflection of their character. It should be just the opposite. They should be a reflection of God's character. And a lot of the time, we as the church body don't do a very good job of reflecting the character of God. It is a lifetime process and honestly, none of us get perfect at it. So if you've been hurt, you've been burned by other believers, by the church, please do not hold God responsible for their dumb actions. He is not a reflection of them. It should be the other way around and we fall short, which is why we need Jesus. Whole point there, why we need Jesus, because we just, we can't keep it together on our own people. What are you guys doing? Knock it off. So we definitely should not go off of just what we see from other people and other believers to be our representation of God. In fact, the only way to truly get to experience, truly get to know him, is to experience it for yourself. And that comes through prayer and study and probably on your own at first, which can seem a little overwhelming and seem a little cumbersome because you don't really have someone to guide you as far as a knowledgeable Bible teacher. But take comfort in this. God is a God who wants you to know him. He wants to be known by you. So if you genuinely pursue him, take the time to read the word, pray, even if you're not that good at it, it doesn't matter. If you make that genuine effort to pursue a relationship with him, 
he will reward you. He won't play hard to get or hide himself from you. He will reveal himself to you in big or even little ways over time, the more you pursue that relationship with him. And there's no set time or, you know, formula I can recommend to you. It's just, if you are consistently pursuing him, consistently trying to know him and making that effort, he's going to reward that but you have to consistently pursue it, just like we do with human relationships. If I don't see my husband for over a year, I can't expect our relationship to be any stronger because I haven't spent time with him and gotten to know him. What are you two doing? These guys are getting really rambunctious, um, so I'll just wrap it up with this. I hope this encouraged you in some way. I know the idea of studying alone, reading, praying alone without any kind of guidance can be intimidating and can be kind of overwhelming. And if a group of believers that you can fellowship with and learn from is something that you know you need and you really desire, then be praying about that. Be praying that he will bring those people to you. And that is kind of where I'm at right now, is where is my group of people to fellowship with and learn from? And I'm starting to get the answer that it's not in one place. It's kind of spread out between friends and family and different relationships serving different purposes. If you want a recommendation for a good study to get started with, just the basics. I hate to say surface level, but nothing too in-depth or theologically dense for now. Then I highly recommend Max Licato's book, Praying the Promises. It's this segmented devotional that really does a great job of talking about the promises we have in Christ. And it's a good little one to read. You know, I read it in the morning. I also read a chapter in the evening and just kind of think about throughout the day. It's a very good devotion. And I'm picky about my devotionals. I can't stand ones that are like uh, the prosperity gospel, you know, what are the Goliaths you need to slay in your life today? I'm not about that. This one is surprisingly very, very good. Uh, and I highly recommend it. If you want something that's more uh, theologically dense and give you a lot of things to think about, I recommend just about any study by Dr. Chuck Missler. Uh, but I would start with the Gospels first and then kind of branch out. If you want one that uh, has a ton of history, actually, uh, I recommended this one to a friend. His study of the book of Daniel is really good and he ties in a lot of those prophecies and history to events that have happened, will happen, all of that. Uh, very, very good, very dense kind of study. But so, like I said, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I can't wait to see you again next time. Tracing my footsteps through the wind